The pink sample demonstrates shaping methods. First, shaping across a row, then selvage increases and decreases, fully fashioned increases and decreases, adding multiple stitches or decreasing multiple stitches, and then two options for internal shaping. There's also a new bind off method as well. I've already started and by e-wrapping across 60 needles and knitting about 20 rows. This first sample, we're gonna decrease evenly across an entire row. So I'll start with 60 stitches that are cast on and knit and then reduce them to 30. So I'll have a gathering ratio of two to one. So the first step is to transfer all of the stitches to their neighbor, doubling up the stitches on every alternate needle. And then I need to move all of the needles carrying two stitches in towards the center of the work so I can fill in all of those empty needles. This takes a bit of time, but it'll get there. Uh, in the sample in class, the one on the wall and then this one I'm working here, my gathering ratio is two to one, but there is another sample posted on the wall that's three to one. And you can see, I think quite clearly, the, the pretty big difference in the flounce uh, that's produced when reducing a, a larger number of stitches to a smaller number of stitches. So here, everything is moved in towards the center. So I've done this on the left-hand side, and then I'll repeat that process on the right-hand side until all of those empty needles have been pushed out towards the left and the right. So you can see here, this is where I started, 30 left and 30 right, and I've decreased everything in to 15 left and 15 right. After I've knit a few rows, you can see the decrease in action. Next, we'll move on to selvage decreases, which are worked quite simply. To decrease in the selvage, move the selvage stitch in one stitch towards the center of the work. You can work this decrease on both sides, regardless of the position of the carriage. Just make sure you push the now empty needles back out of work, otherwise they'll pick up a float or a loop and then negate the decrease. Selvage edge decreases can make seaming a bit more difficult because we're muddying the selvage edge a bit because that's where the decrease is taking place. The fully fashioned decrease, which we'll get to in a minute, uh, is most often, but not in every instance, a better option. So here you can see this decrease has created a slope in the work. Uh, and then we'll move on to the simple or selvage increase. So. What's a little bit different here is that you can only work this increase on the carriage side of the work. So to work the simple or selvage increase, pull a needle to working position on the carriage side of the work and knit across. So here you can see the slope or that shaping. Uh, this method does result in some large loops on the selvage edge, which typically isn't too terribly desirable. So the next uh, increase and decrease are fully fashioned, meaning the increase is offset from the selvage edge and worked inside the work, but still close to the edge. So this time we'll use a triple prong transfer tool instead of the single and move a group of three stitches in towards the center by one stitch. So now that third needle in from the left carries two stitches and therefore the decrease. This can be worked on either side of the knitting, does not matter where the carriage is. Because we're offsetting the decrease from the selvage edge, it'll make seaming much easier because those two edge columns will remain uninterrupted by a decrease. So if you look at the sample on the wall, you'll see uh, two columns of stitches that are straight in a sense. Um, and that fully fashioned mark appear in the third column.
fully fashioned increases are made in nearly the, an identical way. So we're still using the three prong transfer tool. This time we're gonna move them out. Um, there are some options here though, because as you can see on the left, an eyelet will form because we'll create an empty stitch. There is a way around that. Um, and I'll show you here in a minute. I ran out of pink, so now we're in blue, but this is still the pink sample on the wall. So pick up the last three stitches and move them out away from the center of the work by one stitch. This will create an empty needle. If we bring the needle back into working position and knit, an eyelet forms, and that's what's happening here on the left. On the right, however, if we want to avoid that, we can fill in that empty needle with a purl bar from the row below. So if we want to replicate the sample that I have in my hand on the machine, because we're seeing this from the purl side, I'm going to fill in the stitch on the left, and then leave the empty needle on the right to form an eyelet. So after I knit two rows, you can see that that gap is closed, but on the right hand side, the eyelet's formed. So again, I'll move three stitches out away from the center of the work, and then I'm gonna pick up the purl bar from adjacent stitch in the row below and hang that on the empty needle. On the right hand side, I'll permit an eyelet to form, but in order for an eyelet to form, that needle has to come back into a working position. Knit two rows. You can pick up the purl bar in the adjacent stitch in the row below from either the left or the right hand side of the empty needle. Doesn't make a significant impact on how this looks from the knit side of the work, but be consistent. Always pick it up from the left or always pick it up from the right. So here on the right, you can see the eyelets have been formed, and on the left, we've closed that gap by picking up the next stitch. The next sample we'll work is a two-step fully fashioned decrease, which hides the decrease underneath that column of three stitches that we transfer in. So to hide it, I need to move the fourth stitch in out to the third, and then move this group of three in one. This can be worked on both sides, doesn't matter the position of the carriage. We aren't reliant on the working yarn here to, to work this decrease. So how this is different from the regular fully fashioned decrease is that uh, previously we had two columns of stitches with the fully fashioning mark within the third. Because we're working this in two steps, we can hide the fully fashioned decrease behind that third column of stitches and not see the fully fashioned mark. So it's just a little bit of a cleaner version. One isn't better than the other, it's just kind of visually what you prefer. So I have worked a bit of a shortcut here by using the three prong tool to pick up that fourth stitch and then move it back. So I'm not having to switch between the single end and the triple end. So here you can see that second stitch behind the third. Uh, and in knitting on the machine, whatever stitch is down first or closest to the gate pegs or the needle bed is what we'll see on the knit side. So this is how we're able to hide the decrease behind this group of three stitches. If I want to increase across multiple stitches, uh, I need to bind on more stitches. So I can really only increase and decrease using the methods we've worked so far by one stitch at a time. If you need more than one, you have to cast on 
across new needles. Because we need the working yarn to cast on, this can only ever be achieved on the carriage side of the work. You can work any cast on method you want. Here I'm using E-wrap, but on the carriage side, I'll pull five new needles to work, E-wrap across those needles, and then knit one row. Because just like a regular E-wrap cast on, there isn't any weight on this new section, I'm gonna keep pulling those groups of needles out to hold until I've got enough knitting established that I can hang a weight in it. To decrease multiple stitches, I'm gonna bind off the number of stitches I want to decrease. So again, I need the working yarn to uh, achieve most of the bind off methods that we use. So this can only occur on the carriage side of the work. I'm going to use the around the gate peg bind off method with the transfer tool that we worked, I think at the end of the orange sample, to bind off the edge most five stitches. When I bind off the fifth, I'm going to hang the next loop on what will become the new selvage stitch, peel everything off the gate pegs, and then continue knitting. Because I'm lifting the end up over the gate pegs, it's a good practice to pull those next two or one needles into hold position so those stitches don't jump out of the hooks and then drop. This um, multiple stitch decrease is probably most frequently found at like the top of a side seam at the underarm before you start the armhole shaping. Shaping doesn't have to occur along the edges, so we can build in some shaping uh, internally or away from the selvage or the edge most stitches. It just takes a, a little bit of a different effort. So I'm gonna transfer out all of the stitches to the left and right of needles, one left and one right. So I'm still increasing by one stitch on either side of the knitting, but I'm going to keep those two center stitches uh, in place. Because I'm creating an empty needle, just like I would with nearly any increase, with the exception of the selvage increase, I have some options. I can fill them in with a purl bar and an adjacent stitch from the row below, or I can let them form an eyelet so long as I push those needles back into work, which is what I'm going to do here. So. I'm going to keep moving all of those needles out by one. It's a group of nine because I started with 10. Uh, and this is going to increase the stitches that I leave alone in the center, but also offset the eyelet by one stitch each time. So it'll create that V shape you can see in the sample on the wall.
I forgot to put my needles back into work. So I can pick up the float that's formed and hang it on that needle that I didn't put back into work. It is gonna make a slightly smaller eyelet because the float length is shorter when it skips the needle versus laying something in the hook. Uh, but will work in this purpose, prevents me from having to rip back a row in this sample that is really just to demonstrate technique. Internal decreases work in the same way as the increases do. So I'm going to move all of the stitches in by one, forming the decrease on needles left one and right one, but still only decreasing across the work by one stitch on both sides. As I work this decrease, the number of stitches I need to transfer in towards the center it will reduce because I'm decreasing from those edges. The new bind off here is very similar to the gate peg bind off with the transfer tool, but instead we're going to use the latch tool. So the first step is to draw all the needles to hold position. And I'm going to use my left hand to do two things. One, it's going to tension the yarn and then the other, it's going to draw the needle back. So because I'm using the latch tool, I can't push the needle in with the tool. There's a hole in it. So I have to use my hand that's tensioning the yarn to draw the needle butt back once I connect the hook of the needle to the hook of the latch tool. And then once the latch tool is behind the gate pegs, because I'm holding the yarn towards the back of the needle bed, I can form the stitch. When I draw the working yarn through the two stitches on the latch tool, it's going to wrap the gate peg with a chain stitch. You can get really speedy with this bind off and this is probably my preferred method for binding off um, it goes quite quickly so you repeat this all the way through and then when you get to the end when you draw that last loop through clip the yarn and draw the yarn tail through that stitch on the latch tool to bind off or finish off that chain stitch that you've worked across the needles